Again, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a really great pleasure to welcome uh, Heather and Elvis to our conference today. Uh, my first contact with them was a very pleasant surprise, and I mean that in an unusual way. In 2018, I heard of the organisation Rooftop Films and that they were making a movie of Chesterton's first play entitled Magic. And when I checked, I found Rooftop Films was located in New York City. Uh, so I thought, oh, this is just after I'd come back from America and had gone to New York City as it happened. I thought, what a, what a missed opportunity this was. So I contacted Dale Orquist, the American Chesterton Society president I mentioned earlier. I was sure he would know of the movie project. He's done movie projects of Chesterton's works. He knew nothing about it. I made further inquiries and then the surprise. Rooftop Films was actually in Sydney in the inner city suburb of Leichhardt. I made contact and met Heather and Elvis uh, as a result. Elvis, um, a little later that year, contributed an article uh, to our publication, uh, The Defendant, on how he came to discover Chesterton. Discovering Chesterton, a movie maker remembers was the title we gave it. And then Heather spoke, uh, at, I think, in our 2019 conference, probably uh, on how the magic project was going. Well, I don't want to trespass on what they'll be saying about the making of magic, so just let me provide a little bit of background uh, and touch on how they came to take on the project. Um, uh, Elvis runs an actors management agency, which he and Heather co-founded and ran for many years together. Um, and Elvis now looks after specifically, and Heather serves as a senior sales manager for a major hair care company. In re relation to Heather, just to introduce um, some details there, but really to say both have had a very long apprenticeship when it comes to, to um, uh, the making of this movie and other projects that they'll mention. Um, Often over the years, uh, people um, asked me about Campion College and said, um, you know, when, when did you first think of this? And I said, oh, it was in the 1960s, actually. And, uh, and I, I remember when I spoke to the staff here on the opening day of Campion, I said that it's uh, taken 36 years to um, make Campion an overnight success. So I, I suspect that's how Elvis and Heather feel about magic. It now looks so complete and organised, which it is, but uh, as if, well, sure, there must have been the odd problem or two, but anyhow, I'll let them speak to that. But Heather's worked um, and educated in hair and makeup, produced numerous photo shots. Uh, managed an extras agency and founded uh, an actors agency. And uh, apart from the co-founding of, uh, of Rooftop, now called Rooftop 7, I presume partly to, at any rate, to distinguish it from <laughs> Rooftop Films in New York, States, in New York City. But, um, but they founded Rooftop 7 as the company so they could develop and produce their own uh, movies and Magic is their first feature. And uh, there's various other projects that they'll no doubt talk about under development that Heather is the executive producer of. Um, Elvis, um, he began in film several years ago uh, and his beginning was studying makeup for screen and theatre. He then went on to become a photographer, taking headshots for actors and models and honing um, the craft of light, as, uh, as they've mentioned to me, which is a wonderful sentence, I think. <laughs> We've tried to hone the craft of light. But he's had experience in managing actors and as an assistant director, uh, undertook uh, many roles in the, uh, in the industry to draw as much experience as he could from small to major productions and gain an understanding of the workings of every department, which is so important when you're trying to do something as um, integrated and as complex as uh, making a movie. 
Uh, so all this was on the way to his becoming a director in particular, which is his special talent. Now, the Australian Chesterton Society has been enthusiastic about the Chesterton movie projects of Heather and Elvis, um, focused on Chesterton's short stories and novels, uh, of course, in particular, and has provided some modest financial support. We believe the medium that they're working in and the quality of their work will do much to promote a wider awareness and appreciation of Chesterton's thought and, and writings. So I'm just delighted to um, uh, be able to welcome them today and please uh, join me as they speak about magic, the making of a movie. Hi, good mor uh, afternoon, morning still, yes, um, I'm a little bit shorter, yes, um, thank you Carl, I must say first and foremost from the time when um, I first made contact with Carl I've never had such a, um, a wonderful warm welcome and throughout the process it's just been so such an encouragement to us. Um, because to have people who really know Chesterton behind you when you're trying to bring something out to light to the world is really very special. So thank you very, very much. Um, yes, one day we will be an overnight success, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't know when that day is going to come. Um, about um, it's, it's really interesting because 17 and a half years ago now... I left working in um, managing our act actors agency to um, go and get a real job so that then Elvis could focus on writing and developing um, projects for film and get into producing. And I gave him five years. That was 17 and a half years ago. So um, we're getting there. Um, but it, it's, it's, it all works to creating what, you know, bringing you to the place you need to be. So whatever you have to go through, that brings you to that place, which is really wonderful. So about five years ago, we decided um, Magic was going to be the first film, which Elvis will go um, into a little bit more. So um, I'll hand it over to you, um, and then I'll come back in a little bit. I'll hand it over to Elvis. Okay. Hello. Speak up. Speak up? How's this? Um, am I projecting well enough? Okay. Just give me a wine though, sweetheart, if I get carried away. Um, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll um, pick up where Simeon kind of left off halfway through when he said, um, the thing about Chesterton is that he looks for the good in, in, in people, in things. And, and I think... I was always thought I was an outsider from childhood. Um, my background is I'm a Syrian. Uh, I speak the Aramaic language. Um, my family I came. Don't know what you mean by? I'm that's. <laughs> I didn't say Siri. Um, <laughs> Simeon. No, she didn't go off that time. So. My family kind of came from parts of, um, turns out to be Ukraine, Kharkiv, and, and northern Iran. Um, they're Christians. Um, they were, the Assyrians are members of the Apostolic Catholic Church of the East. Look that one up. So, <laughs> so they were basically chased by the Turks, and they, who tried to wipe them out. And um, so they ended up with the British um, in Iraq for a long time. I ended up being born in Baghdad, Iraq. So the idea of rooftop to me is a place where you live. And because in summer, we lived on the roof. All the beds, everything was taken up there, and you lived under this beautiful starry sky. And so, and my fondest memories as a child have always been of, of looking for God in, in that sky. And that was, that was just life. And 
you know, uh, our belief in God was just a normal, natural thing. We were surrounded by community because we lived in a suburb. There were basically just Assyrians and a few Armenians and Jews thrown in. But you lived in a community where you could be on, on the roof of your house and speak with your neighbors. And everybody knew each other because we all had this thing that we were in a scary place, being a very small minority surrounded by Arabs and Muslims, and, and this is, we're talking in the 50s and 60s and beyond that, because our group, our lot, had they tried to wipe us out several times. Um, fortunately, my grandfather served with the British um, RAF in uh, a base just north of Baghdad called Habania, where my father was born. And so we were under the British mandate, so we were protected by them. And so that protection, we lost that the year I was born, 1958. Um, and so things started to get hairy, and that's why we ended up coming to Australia. Anyway, cut a long story short. So uh, it, I've, I've kind of grown up in, in this feeling because you live there as an outsider. I came to Australia, and um, I kind of sounded like this. And I was this skinny little dark kid in, in this very white society. And I remember going to my father crying because the teacher was worried about me saying I hadn't spoken for, I'd been there for two weeks. And, and I said, you told me they spoke English here. I couldn't understand what anybody was saying. <laughs> and people would say, I'll beat you at the, at the Ronde, the Sarvo. <laughs> I didn't have a clue what that was. And so it, it, it took me a while to get used to the fact that they do speak English in Australia. And so I've, I've grown up here. But being an outsider, that's how I've always felt. And in everything, everywhere that I've been, that's just been me. This spirit, the soul trapped inside this weird outside body and, and then the world even being further you know, removed from me. And then I discovered the word outlier. And that's the positive side, seeing things in, in a positive light, that I'm not an outsider, maybe I'm an outlier. And that's a nicer place to be. And, um, and I think Chesterton was that. He was an outlier. He was just kind of never you know, in the average. And he understood what it was to be kind of out there in the wings. And so I was driving one day and, and surfing the radio and I came across a, a radio station and somebody was talking about a book called Soul Survivor. And it turned out to be a Christian channel. I think it's Hope 10 something something. And, and um, point four. And anyway, and he, and he talked about, he was talking about this book, so I thought, I have to read this book. I read the book. It, there was a chapter in there about Chesterton. I thought, I have to read this man. And so I, uh, the book that was mentioned was Orthodoxy. I got Orthodoxy. I started reading Orthodoxy, and I thought, this is, I don't know if I, I can get into this. And I thought, what else has he written? I found that he'd written um, The Man Who Was Thursday. I like stories. So I got The Man Who Was Thursday, read that, fell completely in love with it and thought this would make a terrific film. And then I discovered that my, one of my favorite directors, Orson Welles, had done a radio play back in 1938. I listened to that and it just started to happen. So I contacted my friend uh, and mentor, Tony Wickert, who uh, said, you should talk. Um, there's a couple of guys you should talk to and um, Australian producers, one of them who was in New York. So. Uh, we organized a trip. I went to New York. Um, I met with Denny, had a talk with him, and he said, we need to talk to Norman Stone. Uh, he's an English director based in, in Glasgow uh, in Scotland. So uh, we met him. He'd come over as well to show off his latest film, which was Florence Nightingale. We chatted. And so I was going to learn to become a producer and be involved in this thing. And we were going to make this film. Ten years later, nothing was happening. I, we talked to everybody, tried to get you know something to happen, and ten years later, nothing. It was going nowhere. In that time, I decided I was going to learn to write. 
if we couldn't get somebody else to write the thing, I was going to have to write it myself. So I took to learning how to write. And I wrote the script, and it was too hard to produce. So I thought, okay, let's look at something else. And then I read um, The Ball and the Cross, and I fell in love with that. And I've written a script to that. And so I wanted to make that. That's the film I really, really want to make. And it's too big. It requires, you know, quite an effort to do. So I thought, what, 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 what now? So um, there's a saying in the film industry, is your first film, try just to do something small, working independently, is you've got to make a film that you basically do in one location with a handful of actors, very few crew, okay? You've got no money. That's what you do. You just make something cheap and just get it done. Most filmmakers, um, all the, you know, the greatest directors you know of today, that's how they started. They made a film in one room. And I thought, what happens in a room? What can you do in a room? Plays occur in one room. So I wonder if Chesterton's written any plays. So I looked it up and researched it, and lo and behold, magic. So I thought, I, so I got my hands on magic and started working on that and played around with it and played around with it and played around with it. And eventually I sort of came up with a script for it and thought, let's do this. And so um, we went about uh, trying to, to get this to happen. Uh, I love theater. I love theater and around. And so the idea I had was, I'm, if um, has anybody been to the Ensemble Theater in North Sydney? So you, you'd be familiar with, okay. Um, so the idea was to kind of create that atmosphere where basically the stage, which sits kind of in the center, and, and everybody is sort of is, sits in a circle around the, the stage, and the stage is lit and everything else is dark. I wanted that feeling of, of intimacy that you have in, in that kind of theater. And so I thought, how do you do that? I decided we were going to build a set. And we actually built a set. That was a, a circular room. And we were going to just light the middle of this room and have the cameraman working in amongst the, the, the actors and, and filming. And so we tried doing that. It failed dismally. We basically ended up with, with really no footage that was useful. And, um, and yeah, I went through a minor depression for a few days. And <laughs> my friend Tony Wickard, or I think Heather, called him up and said, what do we do, what do we do? And he said, just get a room, put your furniture in, in any room, anything, and just shoot the thing. So we did that, and, um, and then we went from there. We... we got this film done. Um, maybe we should have a little look and just see. Just three quick clips. So. Let me call it twenty thousand. It'd really pay a sum like this to know how I did that trick. I would willingly pay much more. I think I did explain how serious the matter is. You'd really pay much more. What if I told you there was nothing in it? Well, if it really is that simple, then I would say a little healthy laughter is the best possible thing that could happen. Only one laugh. But as you say, it is something quite simple. It's the simplest thing there is. That's why you won't laugh. Why? What do you mean? What shall we do? You will disbelieve it. Why? Because... I did it by magic. 
You mean to take that check and then tell us it was only magic? No. I mean to tear this check and tell you it was only magic. Oh, hang it all, there is no such thing. Yes, there is, and I wish to God that there wasn't. Really, sir? Magic? Yes, Your Grace, one of those larger wars that you were telling us about. What do you want? I never believed you were a wizard. You never believed? I always knew you were a man. I am a man. And you're a woman. And all of the elves are gone to Elfland, the devils to hell. And you and I will walk out of this putrid house tonight and be married. Wow. People gone crazy in here tonight. What am I saying? <laughs> As if you could marry me. Oh my god. This is the first time your courage has failed you. What do you mean? I mean to draw your attention back to the offer you just made. I accept it. Oh no, no, no. It's nonsense. As if a man could marry an angel, let alone a lady. My, my mother, she was a lady, and she married a dying fiddler who tramped the streets. The mixture still plays havoc with my body and soul. I can see her now in dirtier and dirtier lodgings, darning socks with weaker and weaker eyes when she should have been wearing pearls. If she just consented to be a rational person. And she might have grown pearls by consenting to be an oyster. She had very little pleasure in her well, life. Well, precious little in everybody's. The question is, is what kind? So I suppose if I got down on my knees. I think knee, this is far more comfortable. I'll do everything your mother did. I mean, not so well, of course. But really, we shall be as happy as is good enough for us. And we'll have confidence in each other at least, and no secrets. I'll insist on knowing all the tricks. I don't know if I'm on my head or my heels. And now, that we're going to be so comfortable and confidential, you must tell me the real practical, tricky little way you did that last trick. How I did that last trick? like that. It wasn't you I was telling to go. No? Well, I think I shall go anyway. This room feels horrible. Horrible? No, 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 no. Just a little overcrowded. And I don't seem to know all the people. But uh, you can't like everybody. Oh, these large at-homes. That's our humble little effort. So, um, closer, okay. Um, so, we, we made this, and um, the way I approached it is probably a little different to how everybody else does this play. Because when I read it, it was written in 1913, um, and you have to take everything in context, and the context the time, uh, the way it was written and the way it would have been acted on stage is quite different. And I think if you go back and you look at the old, and look at English films from that the 1930s, as, as far back as you can go to the talkies, and you get a feel when you, you know, when you see English films from that period, for instance, the way that they act, the speech, the rhythm, everything is, is very, very different to the way we are in the 2020s now. And so I couldn't go back and, and do this um, the way it was originally done because um, the story was uh, the, the conjurer, the stranger, it's, it's a love story. And um, he and, and the girl, Patricia, and fall in love. And, you know, in the end, it kind of ends up, it, it, it ends quite happily with them just about, 
you know, saying that they're in love with each other, you know, when he's about to leave. I didn't want to do any such thing. So I took that out completely. And so, um, and, and I kind of had to make changes to, to the approach, to its rhythm, to its context, to its themes and everything. Not taking away from the original, I wanted to keep what Chesterton had there underneath, but I had to bring it to a contemporary audience as best as I could. And so that's, you know, um, one of the things we played with was this idea. Now, the guy who played the conjurer, Vincent, is actually a magician. He's worked as a magician. So we discussed a lot of things. The, the tearing of the check that happens, and we've made it, I think, 20,000 pounds, the check that is written for him to give up the secret. I mean, that's one of the oldest tricks there is. Um, you know, when magicians will take somebody's $20 note and rip it up in front of their eyes and then, you know, pull it out from somewhere. Um, at the end of the film, uh, when he's outside again, he actually has a check in his hand. And we don't know if it's the £20,000 check or the £20 check that was given to him. So I, I'd like to believe it's the 20000 one because he decided that he'd earned it. Um, but there, there's a lot of things there. Um, but you can ask me about it. I, I could go on forever. Now, so this was our opening act, this film, and it's something that we, we could make. Um, the next one is, um, that we're coming to is the Club of Curious Trades. Um, it, uh, it's called um, that because I, the book it's based on is the Club of Queer Trades. And so I had to change that because of the connotation. So, <laughs> but um, we've decided we're going to step our way up book by book. And, and I'm still going to make The Man Who Was Thursday. One day, I will do it. It's huge. Um, and I'm, but the one that I really want to do is The Ball and the Cross. Because the two... Is, are you guys familiar with The Ball and the Cross? And yeah. Yes, no. It's a discovery. It really is. I think if you're into Chesterton, you should read it. Because I look at what is going on in the world today. Um, and and the, this tribalism that's, that's taken hold of the world. I, I look at the U.S. now, where it's the right and the left at the moment. And it's, it's everyone's being split into two camps at the moment, and, and this is what's going on. And everybody looks at it in, in a way that it is a bad thing. And there's another way to look at it, looking for the good in what's going on. And um, the two characters in that, one is a Roman Catholic who comes from some shore in scotland and this guy is being grown you know he's been brought up in a very very small community and is extremely catholic to the point that he didn't know that there were non-catholics in this world that anyone who was a non-catholic actually existed in the world when he comes to london um and then on the so he's on the far right on the far left is this atheist socialist character named turnbull who runs uh, a paper called The Atheist News, and he writes terrible, terrible articles about the, um, the Virgin Mary and the Virgin Birth and so on. And so these two characters clash, and they decide to have a duel to the death to make a point about their beliefs and ideologies. And so the whole story is about these two guys trying to kill each other to make a point whilst being chased by the police. And, and it's this crazy adventure, this journey that goes all over England. It goes to what they think is France, but it's one of the Channel Islands. And then they end up in a lunatic asylum where Lucifer, Satan himself, is actually running the asylum. And then it turns out now he's taking over the government. He's taking over Parliament and so on. And it just goes on and on. But the wonderful thing, the message is in that, is that these two guys are willing to fight and to die for their beliefs. And they're both wrong. 
in their extremism. But what it does is that it wakes up all the rest of the world, all the people who've gone to sleep. And this is the so there is something positive in in that. And why I like these two guys is that that they were based on Chesterton, the characters. One was Chesterton, the Catholic, and the other one is based on George Bernard Shaw, the socialist. And it's about their friendship and the fact that they debated each other constantly, and yet they remain friends to death, the closest of friends. And so there is something, you know, I, I, this is what I want to do, is look for the positive and, and just bring that out in the best way I can. And, and film is the medium that I kind of know. So this is what, what we're doing. So again, that's, that's the love of my life, that film. Um, but yeah, Curious Trades, we've taken four of the stories and the first three and then the last one. And I've made them into one story. Uh, although they, they're separate, you can see them as ep episodes, but you can watch the whole thing as well as one feature. And so that's, that's the project that we're working on next and Heather can tell you about. So I think I'll just shut up because I'm probably not saying very much. Sorry. Visionary. <laughs> so the way we work is Elvis puts forward the vision, he writes and he directs, and I make the vision happen as a producer. So we work very well. We've been working in partnership pretty much our whole married life for over 30 years. So um, a little bit on the making of, like, when we made Magic... Um, yes, we did it twice. And what the wonderful thing was, even though the, the first... It was a very intense experience both times um, because we, we did it in a very short time period. So the first one was done over one weekend and when that failed, we thought, oh, we can do it in two weekends, um, the next... <laughs> the next filming. Um, when you looking at that, um, it's actually the inside of the Balmain Town Hall um, meeting room. And to we had to bump in on a Friday afternoon after the knitting ladies finished <laughs> because they wouldn't give up their spot. <laughs> So it was it was fun. So we had had four meter high ceilings. So we had to get scaffolding because the only way we could light it was by hanging lights from the existing lights. So we very precariously got up on the scaffolding, and um, and hung these lights. And um, even the actors came and helped. We had students working on the films with us, um, which is a great passion of ours to actually have sort of people in their graduating year or sort of new graduates working because we know how hard it is to get into the industry. Um, we, when Carl mentioned sort of being a nobody, um, you know, and then coming becoming um, successful overnight, um, we really are within the industry outliers because we haven't gone through the traditional path so that's why we knew this first one we needed to fund it ourselves and we, we did have a little bit of um, help with in the, the final runnings which helped us with the editing process from, um, from the Chess, Australian Chesson Society which was really wonderful. And um, so we, we got it made. It ended, ended up being two weekends, one night and then two pick-up days which is pretty big for a... Um, a feature film. Most people will spend at least four weeks um, doing that, if not three months, mm. would you say? Yeah. Um, so it, it's been a really amazing thing. And then we had COVID and we were trying to edit it. And um, through the editing process, which Elvis never mentions, is that he actually learnt to edit as well. He worked... We had a very kind um, editor who said, well, look, um, this is your budget... So therefore, how about I give you access to my editing program and I'll teach you what to do. You put down the bare bones. So Elvis actually took on um, a journey of learning to become an editor as well and now is actually a very fine editor. He did the fine cut, he did the trailers, 
Um, so we're kind of do-it-yourselfers, um, which is another thing that is not normal in the film industry because there's, everybody has their own jobs and they only do those jobs. Um, but we do like um, doing a few more things. Um, and it took us um, two, year, three, two, two, two years, mm. two and a half years, yeah. um, to get it through to the final. And it was released on the 28th of December. Um, and it was amazing. But one thing that we have to do now is actually get known in the industry because if we're going to attract investors into the next films, and which are bigger, so the, the Club of Curious Trades is a step up and we just have been um, accepted into the Actor Awards, which is the Australian Academy of Cinema and Television. So we qualified for that because we're showing on Amazon, um, Amazon Prime in the US and UK. We're on Tubi now um, and uh, quite a few other platforms, streaming platforms. And there's a DVD will be coming out in the next sort of month, which is fantastic, which will be for sale as well. Um, so by entering the Actor Awards, we know we're not going to win against 3,000 Years of Longing or um, Elvis <laughs> or The Drover's Wife. We understand that, but it's about getting into the film community and sort of not being such outliers but actually becoming known a little bit. So with the Club of Curious Trades, we will be sort of um, drawing on the industry a little bit more, we hope. Um, possibly get a little bit of funding here and there, which would be really nice. Um, it's interesting that there's a lot of criteria that you have to meet to be able to get funding. So whether we meet that with a Chesterton film or not, possibly not, but we'll, we'll give it a good go. Um, other than that, we'll be crowdfunding and, um, and crowdsourcing as well for um, venues and things. But it's, it's been quite a journey and the journey continues into the next um, film. So it's really good. And we will get to make The Ball and the Cross and we will get to make The Man Who Was Thursday, which is giant. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Any, any questions? Have we got time? It's good. It's yeah. close. <coughs> yes. Just from uh, ask a question about the music. Just from those short clips, the music seemed really perfect. Like, did you commission a composer, or did you source? How did you do that aspect of one? One of our actors who James. plays plays Morris in the film is an incredibly talented guy, and he's also a composer. He actually yeah. studied um, film music, and he did composing, and he plays. Every most instruments except for woodwind, and so he actually composed the music according to each character. So throughout the film, there's actually um, you'll notice instruments that represent each character, which is really cool. And he, um, yeah, so he played the instruments, he composed the music, and he produced the music as well. So, yeah, it's very clever. It, it seems like you're really branding yourself as a, a Chesterton production company. Is that is that fair? Yes, yes and no. Um, <laughs> it's sorry. Okay. Um, no, I I I, I don't want to be boxed in too much. Um, what I love are are the themes, and and um, it's the themes. And I really identify. It's what I identify with. My favorite film of all time is It's a Wonderful Life. It's like, I, there's a lot of films that I like, but that's the one I'll always go back to. Because whenever I feel depressed and that my life is just awful and worth nothing and I'm a failure and it's just I watch It's a Wonderful Life and by the end of it I go, yeah, I want to live and so that film touched me so, um, throughout, it, I mean I, I, yeah, for decades and decades since probably my 20s, it's, it's been my go-to film and 
I was reading an article about it, and somebody said that it, they could never really figure out the number of people who did not commit suicide because of that film. It's countless. And Frank Capra is one of my favorite directors. And, and I just to think that that could be your legacy in life. You know, Paul, the Apostle Paul said, if I could just save one. Frank Capra in that film may have saved hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of suicides. That's, is, so if I can do something, and, and you know, that's what I want to do. And if that's the, f that's the film that makes me think, I want to be a filmmaker. Nothing else. I, I'm not into James Bond. I'm not into all these Marvel films. I, they bore me to death. But I would go back to a Frank Capra film any day. I'd watch it a hundred times. So, and that's these are the things that I've, I see in the characters, the themes that Chester and I really identified with. And I think, you know, the thing is that back to the rooftop. When you hear it, something good news. You just want to go to the rooftop and shout it out. And, you know, back in the Bible days when you did, everybody knew you. So they'd say, oh, it's Elvis up on the roof shouting. You know, what's up? You do that here and people will think you're crazy and have you carted away. So the way, what we want to do it is, is this way because Christianity spreads through synagogues and that's how it from one synagogue to another and that's how it and so this is a synagogue we're in today and this is how I, I I imagine this is it's going to spread but who it's really meant for is not necessarily what we do is is for Chestertonians and I do hope that they like what we do it's actually meant for the people who've never really read Chesterton or, or know of him or whatever that you know what that they could watch something and they could go you know what? There is something good to life. There is something good to my neighbor or my friend or my like. I I just want to share the themes. So, and if I find something else that does the same, yeah. Were you ever tempted to do Father Brown? Uh, only when I've actually read some of the Father Brown short stories. Yeah, only and especially because the one on the BBC is awful. It's tripe. It's absolute BBC tripe. It's lazy. It just... And when I read a couple of the shorts, I thought, this is really good. But I would do it as the book says. It'd have to be. Because it's too clever. Um, and, and it's kind of... It's more Poirot than Poirot. And that's what I really like about it. And I think the the character that um, uh, what's his name, David Suchet plays, he's really good. I think David Suchet would have made a much better um, Father Brown because he would have taken it seriously and actually really done it well if he'd had really good writers. Would have been brilliant. Catholic so producers would have helped us, but possibly, Catholic yeah. Producers. <laughs> well, uh, directors. Yeah, well, yeah. Good luck with that. It's that's that's the the, the that's problem, right. and and um, yeah, it's the the system is in the U.S. It's run by bean counters, and so all they care about is what you know what they think people are wanting, and it's just turn money turnover. So nobody you know cares about anything. Everybody, I know, we were talking about the whole woke thing just a few minutes when we were outside. It's Hollywood has just gone very woke. Not because Hollywood it actually feels bad for what it's done or whatever. They're just thinking there's a buck in it. <laughs> and so now you're seeing it's like everybody's going to go. It's just going to get that way because they think, okay, there's, there's money in it. But as soon as it, it starts to fade, you, you watch. They'll go the other, to the other. They just, they just go where the money is. And, and unfortunately, the BBC has, has its own issues and so uh, yeah they just make they're making tribe sorry. Just add something to that. Um, with Father Brown the way it is at the moment we couldn't make it in any time soon because the impression that people have of it is as it is so we would be setting ourselves up to fail 
if we tried yes. to compete against something we like that. We wouldn't call it Father Brown. We wouldn't call it Father Brown. So maybe down the track, um, when we're making more Chesterton, um, you know, and, and I guess at the moment we are seen to be a Chesterton production company, but we don't. We just don't want to be. Um, hedged in and it's interesting because even with the people that we have work on the set um, and working with us we're not um, looking for you know Christian or Catholic or anybody in particular because what was one really interesting thing was that the people that worked with us were affected by the material so if you're only ever working with people that are already knowing the material and who are already in love with it, you don't actually affect anybody beyond your own sphere. So we want to be able to affect people beyond that. And the wonderful thing with Chesterton is it makes people think. And that's one thing that a lot of people don't do these days. They watch films, they watch movies, and it's just sheer entertainment. They walk out the door and they forget about it. We want to make films that when they walk out the door, they keep talking about it and thinking about it. And it's been really encouraging because we have actually had lots of messages from people who've said, wow, I've, you know, I can't stop thinking about it or I've watched it three times now because there's so much in it. And that's not us. That's the material that we're working with, which is why it's so wonderful to work with mm. Chesterton. Yeah, the point on that... Uh, oh. Sorry, no, go ahead. The point on that was that I read recently that uh, Shia LeBeouf, a young man who portrayed uh, Father or Saint Padre Pio, <coughs> uh, has uh, had his life totally turned around, and he said uh, that it's because of his portrayal and, and his experience of the, the immemorial mass mm. as distinct to what he called being, it's as though someone wants to sell him something during the Novus Ordo Mass. Yes, mm. yeah. And, and I think that's, um, there's a lot of films in the Christian genre and a lot of the time the only people that watch them are Christians. And so what's the point? <laughs> I mean, it's lovely. Everybody wants to be entertained, but that's not yeah. what we're about. I, guess. I mean, the, sorry. The, there's a um, there was an awful film called God's Not Dead, and and um, it's just horrible. It and it, it. I'm sorry if you like it. Anybody who's seen it, but I, it's just it's horrible. Um, you know, it, it, it kind of there's this this idea of an us and them that you know. And, and any evangelicals in here? But there's a thing about the evangelicals in the U.S. So they have, it is this, you know, you just get up there and you say, you know, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus three times and you're, oh, that's yeah. it, you're good. Oh, yeah. and, and, and you're saved. So you could, whatever you do, you know, you're saved. You're being washed by the blood. And so, and then anybody who's not is going to hell. And that was the message of that film. And what upsets me more is that that whole thing that God's not dead is taken completely out of context because any professor who is teaching um, philosophy will know because it's it's yeah it, it's part of a, a message that was by Nietzsche yeah. yeah what he's saying that it starts that we have killed God and it's metaphorical, and he's talking about so what shall we, re, you know, what do we replace him with, and and how awful he was talking about how awful societies become when there is no God in society. That was the that they took that completely out of context and turned it into a hammer to beat people with, and and the, I don't like that. And so the, I again coming back to this thing is that what we want to do is just make people think that there is more than just the material world, that there is something more to them and more to life and more to everything than just this. And so that's, yeah. Another, actually thinking of another one, sorry to, The Alchemist. Anyone read The Alchemist? That is a beautiful book. That's another one. I, oh, I would just, yeah, give up an arm to do that one. But, yeah. Oh, just the quote from Nietzsche was 
God is dead, we have killed him, and we will never be able to wash the blood, the blood from him. Yeah. 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 He, and I'm, I was going to ask that question. I might ask an embarrassing question. If people wanted to support you financially because you're not going to get funding from the Australian film industry <laughs> in all likelihood, no. um, the, the, you should have to tick to There's so boxes. many boxes yeah. and, and, so and how yeah. How people support you? Like, I know the Cheston Society gave a modest amount of money, but going forward, you'll need crowdsourcing. So, mm. how can people support your work? Yeah. Um, so we're going to be setting up a, um, an Indiegogo campaign once we've sort of got through um, um, sort of the next little bit. So um, sort of the probably January we'll set up an Indiegogo campaign. Um, we um, I've left some pamphlets um, outside um, and it's got all our contact details on there. So... Um, once we start um, sort of raising money, there's my email address. Um, I have thought about putting a donation button on our website. I haven't had the courage to do it yet. Maybe we should. Um, and um, the other thing, so it's, it's so that financial, we are looking for financial assistance and um, possible investors. So we'll be reaching out to um, people, but also crowd, um, like sourcing um, places to shoot, locations and things. So that's something. So it's not always money that makes a difference. It can actually be, you know, ha finding a place where we can shoot where we're not paying 2000 or 3000 or $10,000 a day because we won't have that in the budget. So um, once we're sort of about to meet with a production designer and then work out all of that, then our budget will get finalised and that's, um, that's it. So maybe I need to put that donation button on the website. <laughs> Would, well, there's, nobody has to press it, do they? <laughs> so, but if they do, it would be amazing. Yeah. So thank you. Should have been evangelicals, I think that would help because <laughs> they can raise money, yeah. um, millions. Um, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, among all the, the fascinating, the other fascinating things that Heather and Elvis uh, said, uh, the the effect on people involved in these projects is. Um, uh, tremendously heartening. I mean, I can testify again, just with um, with the development of Campion College, how people who have come along, including potential students who had no desire to come to the college and just did it to placate mum or dad, and then uh, came to a summer school or whatever, and uh, decided um, this is where they want to be, this is where they want to study, and in many cases have gone on and done done great things. So uh, I think the, the, the way that uh, Elvis phrase being an outsider to an outlier is, is a very good transition and the, uh, the fact too I think that as with both their creativity and their perseverance um, they're also clear in a sense they want to remain outliers, that is they want to remain a different, saying something different, doing something different cinematically and um, Again, I feel uh, uh, that the, the uh, Campion has been something of a parallel. When we when we began with the planning of this project, uh, it was very hard to raise mass meetings in a telephone booth. Um, but uh, as time went along, um, uh, and remaining as best we can distinctive, offering something that other institutions don't offer, similarly movies that are not being offered by the mainstream uh, studios or the main, um, the best known of the movie makers uh, can be an advantage when it starts to uh, acquire a reputation for being outstanding, particularly when the quality speaks for itself, the quality of the work. Uh, so I think that's where the perseverance comes in and just thinking, well, I am on to a good thing here and I'm just going to... You know, sure, you make uh, adjustments around the edges, but the, the the central 
focus, um, the themes that you want to explore and reveal through um, the medium of the cinema, uh, you're going to stick with it. So I think it's uh, a great credit to uh, Elvis and Heather that um, they've been doing that and uh, have produced magic. So thank you again. <laughs>